In this podcast, we chat about the win against Leicester. Look ahead to Bristol City and answer your podcast questions. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast, and this is why Borough Match Day chatter in a pod. Want support? Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Abanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Abanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Bora Breakdown Podcast with Johnny, Dana and Tom. We're the Bora Podcast that gives you all of your Bora Match Day chatter in a podcast. And it was Bora's first win against Leicester since 2002. Uh, TVs were just invented in Burnley, if you've ever listened to this podcast. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dana was thinking of a TV from 2003. Um, but Bora won against Leicester in 2002, courtesy of Frank Sinclair on goal. And we won 1-0 again um, with a Sam Greenwood free kick, which was an absolute peach but more about that later borrow two points off the playoff places now and guys what a fantastic win yesterday wasn't it um dana what was your your one key take out honestly that we are incredibly lucky to have michael carrick as a manager i just got the feeling during the game that wow like this is a manager that just knows his stuff that's obviously done his research on leicester and implemented a game plan that really counteracted them the man marking the fact that we were very aggressive and in their faces and i feel like that's very clever obviously it won't just be carrick it'll be aaron danks it'll be jonathan woodgate it'll be the analysts but to head that contingent of coaches Michael Carrick is absolutely fantastic and you know indulging in a few of the post-match reactions from Leicester and how they're maybe a little bit overreacting in regards to um what's his name their manager but Marquesa is it Enzo Guardiola, yeah, bald, yeah. bald in oh. Italian Scott Parker. You know, I was, just, I was thinking yeah. of how that guy on that Leicester podcast was saying his name, Tom. So I got thrown there. But yeah, they're, they're maybe questioning a little bit. We've got Super Michael Carrick, and he knows exactly what we need. Yeah, very positive uh, on that one. And I agree, Michael Carrick. You know, fantastic appointment, and I love uh, we've had him for over a year now, and. It's just nice to see us develop. And I think my key take out was probably we're developing in, in just in different ways. And we always speak about like the journey and the 1% and the differences and sound very philosophical in a way. But when you look at football and, and where we've came from and where we are now, and we speak a lot about Boris defense in this podcast, but it's nice to see. I think that we have developed probably from where we were, maybe under Wilder and to, to for the start of Carrick. And to now, I think Carrick mentioned it in his press the other week that around our own box we are fairly sound and i would probably echo that i, I would agree um it's just we've conceded a lot of worldies this season and it was quite nice to score our own um, but we are developing i think we are adding more strings to our balls team we'll come to that in just a moment but tom what was your, Wait, your key I, take out as well oh, go on can i just say i did get that pronunciation wrong that was how that leicester guy was saying it it's moresca not my Kaiser. Mm. So sorry, Leicester you've, fans. You've, sorry, been, you've been done there. You've been, I've been, you've been done there. I've you've been conditioned. absorbed that. Yeah, I've absorbed that into my pronunciation there. Sorry. Yeah, carry on. Uh, and then, Tom, obviously, what, what's what's your key takeout from the, from the week? Well, I mean, I had a key takeout, but my key takeout now is God, I'm old, because I can remember that Leicester win in 2002. I, I can, sat, yeah. <laughs> I was what sat in my grandma's ball, car yeah. in, the, in the car park at Billingham Golf Club, just, just listening to the radio, and they were saying how uh, incredible that own goal was, and I can... I can picture it. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm old, but um, yeah, the uh, the one key takeout for for me is that I'm I'm just buzzing to see the uh, the clean sheets back. Um, that's what I was saying last week on the podcast. I'd much rather see us one nil and uh, not concede in, in a game like that. It's probably not the way I would have wanted to to see it because obviously Leicester had far too much of the of the ball as well, but also they didn't really do anything with it, and we seemed happy. To, to let them have the ball at times because uh, I mean they were playing out from the back quite well but then they get into midfield and attack and they just weren't creating anything and it's it was a very um, what's, a, what's a phrase like mature performance from us I thought to to see that out and to to get a goal as well because I think we we did have 
arguably some some very good chances that that we could have taken prior to that free kick and uh I, I would say that I mean a draw would have been fair but also we we were good value for the win yeah and it was a different mills for yesterday wasn't it from from what we've definitely been seeing over probably more past the 12 months and when we're looking at probably Chris Wilds here as well when Millsbury would look to dominate the ball uh, for the majority of the game we've seen that for quite a while now but yesterday was a little bit different then we didn't have much of the ball I think it was the first, well, it was the first time we've seen it for a long time you know 33% of possession but what was your overall assessment of yesterday I know you said suit my character at the start really good game plan but I want to just let, delve into that a little bit more what was your overall assessment and everything? Well, firstly, I think we deserve the win and I based that on Borough's doggedness out of possession. It was a big game on concentration and I think Carrick did get the game plan absolutely spot on. I was having a look on Saturday morning of how Leeds tried to combat Leicester and tried to get at them and it was press them really aggressively and really high up the pitch and then strike them and have that really quick incisive passing movements to be able to cut through them. But it didn't quite have that and at times I thought that we were a bit guilty of holding on to the ball, taking just that extra touch that wasn't needed. A few passes were a little bit astray. So I think that's maybe where we we fell down a little bit. But out of possession, we were absolutely fantastic. In possession, as I touched on there, not the best performance from us, but we just needed that moment of magic, which obviously Sam Greenwood supplied us. I thought we ended the, the first half with the better chances. We had Crooks, Fry, Jones, um, Corbett and Chance as well so I think there's there were opportunities at the end of the half that gave me confidence going into the second that maybe we could get at them there were a few vulnerabilities of theirs and I thought Leicester were very very wasteful the amount of times that the crowd reacted with a way because they just spooned a shot out and Mavididi basically hit the corner flag for one of them and Again, Yusuf probably got hit with another one in the South Stand. It was a very poor performance from them in front of goal, but Borough were very proactive in their game plan. And whereas previously, I think that we've maybe been guilty of being passive and allowing the opposition to basically dictate the game. Obviously, they did have the majority of possession, but as Tom said, I don't really think they did much with it. And in the end, if you look at the XG, we out-XG'd them. I think yesterday it was 0.98 for us and 0.8 for them. I don't know whether that's changed or updated since, but I thought Borough were good value for it, to be honest. Maybe a draw would have been a fair result, but at the end of the day, when you see Sam Greenwood hit that in the top bins, then we deserve the win based on that alone. Yeah, and you know, on, on the Greenwood thing as well, there's there was there's an opportunity in the first half where he takes a shot and he could have he plays it to Cook. So I'm thinking, yeah, like, bad oh, decision. Like, but you know, he made up for it with a free kick and it was fantastic. And you know, it was a very I thought it was quite quiet yesterday, Greenwood. Um, but I think you know, naturally, I think he is because when you haven't got possession of the ball, you, you probably won't get the best out of him. And but when I looked at uh, Leicester, and I, and I think you're right, D as well around um, how they play and how Leeds occupied a game plan in Sunderland as well and when I watch Leicester play they're very very expansive in terms of how they want to play and they create big gaps in the centre of the pitch because of how far the wing backs are they'll try and play a three at the back and uh, from that four to three and they'll try and be really wide try and stretch your team but we kept the shape quite well yesterday they were trying to get those turnovers and then hopefully when you do that you you get that overload in the centre of the pitch and you, and you go on to score but they were very good of probably pressing us yesterday and I'll come up to that in just a moment but Tom we only had three, 33% possession yesterday it's actually our lowest under Carrick um, by probably some distance is, is, as well so do this kind of show like a new side to, to Boron that we can do the defensive work as well I, I think so yeah I mean obviously I was I was listening to um to you talking on the the Leicester podcast earlier this week and saying we're probably going to approach it the same way we do every other game and I think there were still principles of that in our performance it's not necessarily that we were happy for like to just kind of like hoof the ball away and they had all the possession and you know they dominated or anything like that they had a lot of the possession but as I said earlier they didn't do a lot with this we tried to keep possession and actively you know move the ball and and, and do stuff with it when when we had it uh which it kind of explains and, and gives some context to those possession stats but we definitely had to do the defensive work yesterday to to keep them out let's i mean as as poor as they seem to be um at, at times they do have quality in that team and 
big shout out to to Dieng. He did have to make a couple of saves to to really kind of keep us in that game because you know they could have easily gone in a goal up at half time if it wasn't for him making a a save off that corner. Obviously, we were unlucky off our own, but um, yeah. We, in in terms of the the defensive work, I couldn't have been any more impressed with with how we did yesterday. Uh, I thought we stood up to the task well. Um, and obviously we just made it very, very difficult for them to to do anything. Um and, and I and I do wonder if if like some learnings of that has came from say the Plymouth game, because there was a lot of times, especially on our right hand uh, right hand side, where Jones had to get back, which obviously we we kind of analysed in the Plymouth game, and he wasn't really doing it then. But Van Den Berg as well had, had seemed to have learned from that experience and wasn't allowing uh, Mavadidi to, to cut inside as much. Or when he did, he wasn't allowing him that kind of like sight at goal, and it just kind of forced them to to recycle possession and you know play in front of us really which was was what we seemed to to want in those defensive positions yeah and they only had two big chances yesterday Leicester and um, Tom there was obviously the corner in the first half where Dieng stretches and puts it wide and there's the collective chance as well and is there anything else that you kind of looked at and you go how did really borrow bore North fire Leicester yesterday because they didn't create too much did they no, they didn't. Um, and like I said, the the main part I noticed was on our right hand side, um, and it, it was Van Den Berg kind of showing Mavidi inside, but obviously blocking that side at goal. It was Jones tracking back, which he did tremendously quite a few times. Um, I did note that they tried to go long and use their pace quite a few times as well. And I, th- I think in that case, it's just kind of like the anticipation of where the ball is going to drop from our centre backs. They did very well because um, neither Fry or McNair was challenging their their strikers uh, or, or wingers for pace. But it's it's more kind of reading the game and, and where that ball is going to go, and they've been able to either get it out or um, or get it back to the end. But I, I thought we in the defensive areas. Uh, recycle possession quite well and although they did try to press us and, and make it difficult for us to to get out barring a couple of occasions um, where see, playing out from the back went wrong um, we we seem to do it quite well um, and, and obviously get out of those dangerous positions It was a fantastic man, man marking going back to the Neil Warnock a throwback to Neil Warnock times uh, going on with um, Fry and Ian Acho and then House and Dewsbury Hall. Dewsbury Hall involved in six goals in his last seven championship uh, appearances away from home for Leicester with one goal and five assists. So to nullify him, I think, was a big, big part of the plan. He's basically the cornerstone of how they tick, essentially. And Leicester aren't particularly great in front of goal. That's the thing. I think this season they've maybe not played as well and maybe that's why some of the as I put it over reactions have come from because yeah they have been winning but maybe their performances have been great but they've been nicking victories but he has been the key figure to their season so far really so to mark him out the game I think was very important and credit to Housen for that because he did excellently and so too Fry with Ian Acho as well. Yeah, I was just saying, then like defensively, like do you think we are starting to make that that progress now? I know there's obviously there's little things that we can implement in games to try and nullify teams, but as a unit yesterday, and I know Tom was mentioning it there, how we've changed and Van der Berg was was fantastic. And I noticed yesterday, if you look at Borough's average positions, we we really started to keep our full backs back yesterday um, and go as much much deeper than he has been. And we try to create those overloads on on the wings rather than in the central areas, which we've seen previously mainly just to try and stretch people and hopefully try to make sure the ball doesn't come in that central area where they're really strong at. And um, what do you think that what well, yeah, what do you think like they're on the defensive side of things? Have we started to make those improvements that you think? I think we have. I mean obviously when you look at it from a a smaller lens, we had the Plymouth game last week in which Borough worked great defensively, but Take last season, for example, and I really hope at some point I will stop talking about last season, but I think we have to just to compare it. But last season, we did let up a lot defensively. And Carrick might have said it, actually. It was either after the Plymouth game or in build-up to the game against 
um, Lester, that we're not really being cut open. And it's kind of what you said, Johnny, in previous pods. It's more that it's our mistakes. And we saw a little bit yesterday where playing out from the back caused us problems a bit. But it wasn't that long ago that we were on a run of three successive clean sheets. And to be honest, it should have been four. But for Jonathan Rowe's uh, fan- fantastic goal against um, us for Norwich. So I think... Honestly, from a much wider lens, we actually are making progress defensively and credit to Carrick for that because last season it wasn't our strong suit. I do think we are getting better with it. Having said that, there's obviously still improvements to be made because we we do still make the odd mistake that puts us in trouble, but hopefully that will be refined. Yeah, and like, look, I think it's one of those things where it's like a very slow like decline in terms of chances given away. Um, and you, you can definitely see it, I think, in, in how we're trying to play this year. It's, it is a little bit different, and you know, we have and it has to be different because we don't have the same players we had last year. Um, but one thing that is very common with, with Borough is playing out from the back, we're really slick from it. We try and break a lot of the presses. Well, yesterday there was a couple of heart in your mouth moments. The mm. do, do you th- is that kind of the risk that we have when we're trying to play this this style? I know we try and chop and change a little bit with playing long and defence, but that's kind of the risk, right? Yeah, it is. And I'm probably in danger of contradicting what I've always said about Borough playing out from the back. But I do feel at times yesterday we could have avoided that by mixing our game up a little bit. I think game state does matter. And when you see Leicester pushing on us in the way that they did, maybe the best thing to do is to avoid putting yourself in that position. And especially when Latte laughs on the pitch, stretch them, try to get them in behind. I really, really wanted to see us do that because he's he's rapid and he's a he's a menace, Latte Lass. He's the he's from the Darwin Nunez school of chaos. And I think that it would have been nice to see us try to get that ball in behind. But at the same point, this is obviously the way that Carrick wants to play, and we're going to play it regardless of opposition. And so I can get it from that perspective. And I think we probably do want to get to, for example, Leicester's quality and ability of playing the ball out from the back, and you're never going to get to that level if you don't go through these hairy moments and learn from them so it was good that we obviously didn't get punished because our recovery was really good and I mentioned this on tees after the game obviously you don't want to be in that position where you're giving the ball away on the edge of your own box but at the same time like Dieng and Fry and McNair like making those key interceptions and in Dieng's case those key saves to be able to recover those positions was really really good maybe that's just what they wanted to do they were like yeah we'll give you the ball and then you'll just see Sadie Dieng save it so it, it's fine you get the get the fob mob, fob mob rating up there but yeah you, you don't want to see it but at the same time it's just the way that we play and unfortunately you're going to have to take the rough with the smooth yeah and look like team set up differently as well and, and they try and like to nullify you in these goal kicks and that oh I was in, really intrigued by yesterday with Leicester is how they did set up from, from Borough's goal kicks and normally where you'd see Borough where they'll play out to the wing back play at centre we'll get up the pitch and we'll have that 3v2 on, on the wing back's position but what was really interesting yesterday with Leicester is that they kind of had two squares uh, in, in the middle of the, the pitch and they used Jewsby Hall as kind of like the pivot and the connector between um, between the the and Yacho and Mavidi and then uh, and you know and, and Per on the right hand side as well. And what they were trying to hopefully do is if say if the ball came in, they would try and move everyone along. And then what was it happening where Bora would try and play from Fry to say Vandenberg or Engel to Hackney. Hackney maybe oh, there's one key moment where I think Hackney turned and just played it across and where normally Housen would be, Jewish Hall was, and then they were able to kind of get that recovery and, and get on, on on target before I had enough bodies back. But it was really interesting yesterday. It's the first I've seen it really where teams kind of played with probably seven players trying to use that press together, um, seven or eight players to, to press together as, as, a, as a unit. And they recovered quite well and was really aggressive. But I think if Bora were able to play out from it, they've got that 4v3 in, in you know, you try to go. And they did it a couple of times. And there was a moment where like, I think we, we played out from the back and then we played it through to Corbin and Corbin did a lovely dummy to get past Vice. And then we just didn't create the chance that we needed to create. But there is moments where you can do it. And with the Engs distribution as well, we're able to play along. And I think sometimes we have to. I think we're cruxing with Corbin there just to try and keep the ball up. I know sometimes where you play the ball forward as quick as you can, that's the quick it's going to come back. But... I think sometimes just to kind of take that pressure off. And I think we did that yesterday a little bit. We tried to adjust it, but 
they were getting on top Leicester in, in a big period of the game from about, about 50, 60 minutes in to about 70 to 80 minutes. And then Borough get a, a free kick and it, at the time it was looked to be an awful decision because Engel is in those four It was four an awful decision. In, yeah. It still was. Four Borough players in the box and, you know, it was like, well, I think, I think at that point as well, it was a 4v3 in the box and Engel had the ball. So all he had to do was, and I would back Engel at that time, to, you know, to pick the right pass. And it turned out to be an awful decision. Everyone was mourning. Um, and then about, about a minute later, it was absolute jubilation uh, with, with Greenwood hitting the top corner. Um, but guys, what were your thoughts on the winner? Because it felt like it came at such a good time, Tom. Uh, when it when it went in, I'm assuming you were absolutely delighted. Yeah, I was buzzing because he had one earlier in the game, didn't he? Um, mm. Which was a, a bit closer in and he hit the wall. And I said to my dad at that point, um, I was like, he's supposed to be a uh, set-piece specialist, so he's going to score one of these at some point. I know there was something different about the second one. I would just, like, when he step, stepped up, I thought, it's going in this. And yeah, absolutely buzzing that he's uh, he's managed to score that. Um, but as to, to add on to what Dan has just said there, it was an absolutely awful decision to, to give <laughs> yeah. a free kick in the first place. Um I mean, I've had conversations about the referee with a few of my mates since yesterday, and I was like, if he wasn't yellow card and so many of our players for no apparent reason, I would laugh about how comically bad his refereeing was. Because, I mean, there was a point point at the end of the game where Morgan Rogers won the ball from someone, uh, one of their centre-backs, I think, while they were trying to play out, managed to get round him, get in the box and take a shot, he hadn't blown for anything up until the point where he was about to shoot and then booked him. I was like, I think he booked him because he <laughs> carried on and, like, you know how they're really trying to clamp down anyway on like mm. wasting time. So I think he got booked because he carried on and then tried to. Did he score in the end or did it go no, wide? No, no, no. It, 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 it was wide saved and it. went wide, but yeah, I mean, I no, one na- no one near me at the time had heard a whistle. Like, yeah, he, I didn't either. He yeah. didn't give anything at first, and and then like just as he was about to shoot, he's he's blown, and then booked him for not stopping within a split second. But yeah, awful refereeing performance, awful decision. But glad we've capitalised on that, and hell of a free kick to win it. Yeah, and obviously it was a wonderful moment. Fans going nuts, Dana. Come, I, I'm assuming, I want to hear your thoughts and, you, and how you were feeling when that hit the top of the net because, you know, obviously family member, Leicester fan as well. It's like <laughs> next to you. Well, I mean, she was born in Middlesbrough and had a Middlesbrough season ticket, but she's left. She's sorry. She's lived in Leicester for the past 18 years. So she was very conflicted. But I was like, I mean, jubilant as was the, most of the Riverside, because firstly, that's the first free kick that we've seen. And we didn't even see the last free kick that we scored because it was British on Belonga against Cardiff in 2020, and that was lockdown season. So it's, the you know, you're probably going further before that since the last time that we saw a direct free kick be scored. And it came at such a crucial time, and it was just a fantastic goal. So firstly, I was jubilant, and then I was laughing because my sister next to me was still sat down. <laughs> and afterwards, I was like, well, you could have, you know, stood up and clapped or something. And then she was like, I just, she basically just froze in that moment. It was quite funny, but it was a fantastic goal. And actually, the 100th goal that Borough have scored under Michael Carrick, so some milestone goal. It was very fitting, actually, that that was the 100th because it was an unbelievable strike. And I'm so, so glad that Sam Greenwood scored that because we have heard a lot about his set piece speciality and mm. how good he is from set pieces. And I have thought, why isn't he taking the ones that aren't directly to shoot, but are to more to cross into the box? Like, why is Housen still on them? And I'm really glad that he scored that because we have put an action to the words and we have seen it now. It's not just Sam Greenwood's good for free kicks, isn't he? We have actually seen a good free kick from Sam Greenwood. It was an unbelievable goal. So fair play to him. Not bad for a Macam, is he? Yeah, I mean, he's scoring for the Bear fans. Absolutely unbelievable. Um oh, it was, shocking. Yeah. Pardon me, French. Shocking. How how does he dare do that? Do you know what I mean? But it was it was lovely yesterday. I think uh, when we when we were stood in the stands, I was I was here stood next to Matt and 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 live and uh, Tom who well, down he's in our in our Telegram chat as well and it's like a nice little board breakdown corner at the moment because there's, there's quite a few people are in our Telegram and also sit near us um, and we're all uh, Matt was going oh it's never going to go in this and I was like it's going in this it's going in I was saying it's going in Michael Dave who I sat next to us I was saying 
he's going to sky this. I'm like, you know, we're going to score. We're going to score now. And obviously it whistles top bins. And it was just so jubilant. And there was a lovely moment as well. And I don't know how many people have seen this, but I, I want to thank the the whole boy who's a vlogger. Um, and he goes up and down the country to watch championship games. And, and he catches this moment from Dieng. And it's amazing because when the ball whistles in, he's, you know, he's doing his stretches and he doesn't really expect it. But I'm like, Obviously, when it hits top bins, you just see Dieng, he puts the top of his head and he's just like running around like hell. So he cannot believe that this has gone in. Like he's just in sheer delight. The whole boy as well is absolutely loving it as well too. And it was such a, a lovely moment captured. And I was so glad someone got it um, because it was just amazing when that went in. And it was kind of like, wow, everyone was feeling like, wow, hands on the head, like very Warnock-esque. Uh, and it was just Bird and was the same, it. actually. If you yeah, watch sorry. the goal back and if you watch the goal back and clock Rav Vandenberg's reaction, it's the same. Hand on the head, the old warning. You can't yeah. believe it either. It, that's what I mean. It's it's a lovely moment. I think uh, with Fiddy Yang as well, I feel like he's definitely becoming like a fan favourite. And it's like another moment which I think is really captured. Um Jake Johnson, who does uh Bora vlog uh as well and has a YouTube channel, Jake Johnson. We'll put all the, the whole way in Jake Johnson's uh channels in in the in the description. Uh, and he catches it as well. So at the end, where are Bor- doing, obviously there's jubilation. And you can kind of slowly see how he's becoming a bit of a fan favourite. And he's got his hands up. He's absolutely loving it. He taps the badge. And, you know, you can just see how much it means to him. But I feel like the absolute delight from all the Borough fans in that moment is is so nice to see. And, you know, I think just for Senny Dieng as well, I just, I'm just starting to love him more and more and more. Uh, each week, every time I see him, but we'll come on to him in just a moment. We do have a question about him, but then I just want to go back to the goal a little bit. Um, we talk a lot about game state and how key moments define games. And I was saying to Matt yesterday as well, I was like, we just need a moment today. I think I, I was like, I, I, I do think we'll win, and he was like, I, uh, and I just said, we just need a moment because I don't, it was, and it, it did happen. I kind of felt like a bit of like a psychic. I was like, I, you know, I know me <laughs> stuff, but I just kind of felt like that game, but. Do you think it just came at just the right time because Leicester were, pretty, were on top at that point? They were. I think they were growing into that second half finally and they obviously hit the post of the Inacho. I made the mistake on tees yesterday saying that he didn't get a sniff. I mean, for the most part, Dale Fry marked him out of the game. We did have two big chances in Inacho. One of them we gifted, in fact, both of them we gifted to him. But yeah, they were, they were coming on to us quite strong and it was one of those it was a bit smashy and grabby at that point I think and it was very very important to score them because it just knocks the stuffing out of them as the cliche goes and suddenly they've gone from looking like they're in the ascendancy looking like the team that's gonna get the first goal and then they have to come on to us even stronger and I think they panicked after that they put Jamie Vardy on and he didn't really get sniffed did he did I don't even think did he touch the ball I can't remember all yeah, I remember was the... Jamie Vardy wife's a grass <laughs> the, there was one moment actually which they probably defined Leicester in, in the last 10-15 minutes where Borough get a throw in and Leicester win it and they clear it and they smash it towards Jamie Vardy's head and he just heads it straight out of play um, <laughs> it, just, it just bounces over it just pings it out and it just hits him and goes straight out um, but that was probably the moment yeah he, he didn't really get much did he and uh, yeah it, it changes the complexion of the game because suddenly Borough have all the control and they can sit back and they can absorb a bit of pressure and they can dig in and I will say he's in my praising place but I'll probably let you two mention him Rav Vandenberg was absolutely phenomenal in that game Mavadidi had a poor one but I think he had a poor one because he was being marked out of it defended really well because of um, Brad Vandenberg. And considering that I maybe criticised him a little bit last week at Plymouth, he bounced back, and that's all you want to see from a player. So props to him. He was brilliant, really didn't give Mavadidi much to go off. And had that one run in the first half, Mavadidi, where he, he did skin him, unfortunately. But other than that... What a performance from Rav van der Berg. A very mature display that made me forget that he's actually a centre-back playing right-back. He just looks very comfortable there. I still can't get over that slide tackle in the first half where my, I think it was Mavadidi running down the left wing and mm. it was van der Berg seemed to slide about 10 yards, get the ball, absolutely wipe so out Mavadidi and then still get back up and play it. Yeah. How has yeah, he still so, got that hand cast on, by the way? He's had it on for like the majority of the season. I thought it was maybe a lucky thing, but then we lost and he's still got been. it on. And it... Well, didn't he dislocate his thumb early on? Probably oh, did yeah, still was got that, some was like, that complications from that or something. 
Yeah, I don't know, but I was just gonna say I was right in front of that tackle by Vandenberg, and he gets absolutely zero of the ball. By the way, it's all man. If it is, it, <laughs> the honest, it looks fantastic from around the stadium from where you guys are. But nah, he doesn't touch the ball at all. He just absolutely wires Mavidi, and it's just it's 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 unreal. I was like, wow, that's a foul. Um, I, I, I was in line with it from like the northeast corner, and like like you say, it looks fantastic from other areas of the stadium. I was watching that, and I was just like, ah, oh, what a tackle that is! Like Terry Butcher for England or something like that. And then yeah. hearing that, <laughs> nah, gets none of the ball, absolutely none of it. Um, but it's it, you know I'm gonna take it uh, for what it is, and obviously I want to. I have a quick chat about Vandenberg anyway, but yeah, I know you alluded to it, Danny. It was fantastic. It could have been any one man of the match yesterday, but for me, I thought it was absolutely amazing. I think it's a, it's a, it amazes me that he's only 19 and he's just getting better and better and better. And he's just adapting more and more uh, as he's, as he's playing that right back position, which by the way, never played there until he signed for Middlesbrough. And it was, it's just amazing that he's actually contributed to that. And you kind of look at him and go, when I went when someone's your, so young, you kind of put them out wide so they can develop and they'll start to come in more central. For me, I know McNair's out of contract at the end of the at the end of the summer, uh, and you know he could potentially be up for sale in January. And you think, is there anyone that can occupy that space? Rav Vandenberg can occupy that space. He can play out from the back. He's comfortable on the ball. Um, he's been defensively fantastic and. Just so mature, and I feel like we've just got such a gem in our hands with with Rav, and I hope he continues that. And there's going to be moments where he's going to give the ball away, and he's going to make mistakes, like the Huddersfield game uh, early in the season, and people crucified for him, crucified him for it. And okay, rightly so at that moment, but the way that he's reacted and the way that he's playing right now, unreal. Arguably, probably Boris like most unsung hero, really. Uh, in, in my opinion, I'll, you know, we'll get all the plaudits. You know, you'll see Corbin every now and again. We'll get something as well, even though he's a bit of a boo boy as well. And divides opinion. Um, but for me, Rav van der Berg at the moment, arguably Boris' best player. Just just alone, fantastic. And Tom, I don't know if you've got any more to, to add on that, but it could have been anyone more than Manchester, but van den Berg for you. Any any more thoughts on that? I mean, I'll have a lot more uh, when we reach the present place. But um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> shall I move on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man of the match yesterday it was between him and Dieng for me, uh, and I'd probably have to edge it towards Vandenberg over over Dieng. Yeah, and and look, like it was a round off a really good uh, performance. But in terms of Leicester, still top the league, joint points on thirty nine, um, still a record uh, for this point of a season. And obviously joint with, with Ipswich as well, who are also doing fantastically well too. And I just wonder if you had any more thoughts on them. Because when I watched them yesterday, in my opinion, I wasn't massively impressed with them. It definitely felt for me that they're a bit of like, um, from the teams that we've seen all come down in the last couple of years, of like the Bournemouth and, and Fulham, both managed by Scott Parker, funny enough, at uh, that time where they would just try and play and play and play. And they had enough quality in the sides to naturally get into that position. Um, but I just wanted to see if you had any more additional thoughts on them because for me, I wasn't overly impressed with them. They are a great side. They've got a lot of really good players. Just behold, I think mean, James Justin, who was a bit underrated, is a fantastic player. Any actual should not be in this division, really. I think he's a really good talent, but didn't really want to know as much yesterday. Um, but I don't know if you guys have anything else, Dana. Dana, do you have anything else? Yeah, I just thought they got humbled, really. I think they went into the game maybe a little bit arrogant, the fans. And, I mean, I think context is quite important there. The arrogance is understandable, given the squad that they've got. They should not be in the Championship. The fact that Brendan Rodgers got them relegated is just a complete disaster class, to be honest. The fact that they've managed to retain some of those players, really good. Obviously, they lost Barnes and Madison, but they've still got some really good players there. And I think they'll be fine, I guess. And we were talking, me and Tom were talking about before we went live, that probably the fact that they've recorded successive defeats coupled with the expectation, then tripled with the squad that they've got equals a complete disaster. When in, in reality, if you take a step back, it isn't. They probably will be fine still. They'll probably win the league. They'll probably still win the league and they'll win it handsomely but yeah there's just a bit of all show no go from them yesterday I thought their final ball was really poor and yeah my sister actually gave me a little bit of a, an opinion that I, I want to say she said that they need some fine tuning the quality's there um 
Brighton needs some new signings in January. Overall, it was a smash and grab game and the free kick wasn't going anywhere but the goals. So, yeah, maybe maybe they do need a little bit of fine-tuning and trust in Maresca or Marchesa, whatever we've decided to call him. Yeah, Machengo, Cheese, whatever, we'll, we'll, <laughs> whatever it is. You know, we'll call it anything. Tom, is, to round it off, have you got anything more to add on, on Leicester and we'll move on to questions? Yeah, I, I think just to, to kind of add context to that game as well, like I, th- I thought we didn't allow them to to play a final ball at times, and um, you know I, I think a lot of their uh, poorness in the final thirds is probably directly related to how well we were defending in the final third. Um, that being said, I, I really didn't get the. Um, the the reaction from from their fans like on on social media and and like their forums and stuff after after the game because I, I went on I had a look just out of interest and it was like the end of the world like we've lost one nil what lost one one nil away for a Maresca needs sacking even though he's joined top of the league um, yeah it, it was it was mad they also thought we were poor which is is an absolutely mm. like deluded opinion to be having because like yeah we if we were poor that game they would have won like we played well and we deserve to to win um so yeah I, I think there's there's a lot of overreaction coming from the Leicester fans at the moment yeah, need to stop drinking the Kool Aid. I think too much success. I think, um, but look, you're in the championship, and you're in the championship for a reason. And there's some good teams in this division. There's some really good teams. So it's just because you're a division down doesn't mean uh, it's uh, you. You have the right to be where you are. But let's move on now. Um, let's move on to podcast questions. Yes, podcast questions. Every week you get the chance to send us a question via Twitter, Bore underscore breakdown, email the Bore breakdown at hotmail.com, or by joining our Telegram chat with over 370 Bore fans chatting anything but Bore. But yesterday was very jubilant in there. A lot of happy Bore fans and a lot of people covering the lesser forums as well. Um, I was particularly delighted because I was on a show where they said the 3 0, 4 0, 4 1, and 5 0. And, you know, it was very nice for me uh, to, to see the 1 0 win uh, yesterday. Um, but let's move on. Uh, let's move on. And uh, the first question is I, I kind of want all of us to have an opinion on this one. Um, it's from Old Boris Sedgefield and says, Is Zach Stefan a loan option when Sandy Dieng is away in AFCON? And Oliver also asks, uh, How good is Dieng in comparison to Stefan? Um, is Zach Stefan an option, uh, Denimal? Do you think that he's an option? No, shake of a head. Uh, no, because he's injured. <laughs> That's the yeah. reason. He, he he got a knee operate or he underwent a knee operation in the summer and he was out for four months. So he's either just about yeah. to come back from it or, you know, he's still out. So either way, lacking match sharpness. So no go for that, unfortunately. As much as he would like to come back, as he said on a recent podcast, hopefully we can get him on here. If anyone can... Um, get Zach Stefan on board a breakdown that'll be fab but yeah no I don't think it's I don't think it's possible because he's injured okay and then Tom how as our, as our resident goalkeeper um how good is how good is Dieng in comparison to, to Zach Stefan oh he, he's better um I, I wasn't expecting this when when he came in I've, I've said on the the podcast before I wasn't really familiar with how he how his distribution was and how he was going to fit into this system but he's somehow even calmer than Zach Stefan. And last season I didn't think that was was possible. I wanna I wanna still give Zach Stefan his due because he was very good in like the one on one situations and you know he, he did have a fair few good saves last season. I can't be revisionist about it and say like oh Stefan was crap. Dieng's you know the best thing ever now. Stefan is still a good goalkeeper. Um but yeah, D- Dieng, I think as as a shot stopper is is better than Stefan as well. And just to, to kind of add a point to, to the first question as well, um, I doubt that Man City would let a, a, a prospect like Zach Stefan go on a one month loan while Dieng's at the Afcon, mm. and then be like, all right, we'll we'll have a be sending him back, or he's going to be on the bench for the rest of the season. Like, if, if it was a longer loan, I don't think City would do that. So. Yeah, there's there's no chance we get Zach Stefan in January. 
Can Zach Steffen be called a prospect at the age of 27? Is uh, Am I going to go football cliches yeah. and put well, I mean, on that? <laughs> goalkeepers don't peak until they're like mid 30s or something like so. That is true. Fair point. Well done, Tom. Uh, fair enough then. Um, and yeah, look, I think Stefan walked so DN could run, really. You know, oh, he's 28, actually. Not... It's not finished. Um, yeah. Uh, so... prospect and he's too old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, like, Stefan could walk so at the end could run, really. And I think, you know, Stefan took all the all the, the anger and frustration last year, whereas the end now is kind of people more conditioned to, to this style. And I think the, the, the both very, very good, good, good goalkeepers. And I think, yeah, we've got a good one in Dieng and great recruitment as well. And, you know, he's, ha- he's had some moments this year, Dieng, where he has, hasn't had a chance. And, you know, I remember a couple of weeks, first few weeks of the season where they were saying, ah, oh, well, Dieng's rubbish. Look at his, like, his goal he's conceded. I was like, well, you go and goal and you see those shots going. Um, because I think he's had a chance. But the, the final question today, and it's from Dave, and he's, and he's uh, sent us a message uh, all the way from Canada. Um, and it was via email. And he said, is the lack of a 15-goal striker going to be the difference this year between possible promotion and missing out? Having a player like Akpom or Archer last year made the difference in tight games. And this year, we don't have anyone quite as clinical. Uh, Tom... Is there a lack of 15 goal striker going to be the difference this year? Just to clarify and add some more context, we've actually scored more goals this time, uh, this season in comparison to last year as well. So we're scoring more, but is it going to be the difference? Well, I mean, we have to put that in context as well. Uh, what, 11 games of that were under Wilder? So you know, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. it's not really a, a, a fair comparison there. Um I don't know, uh, to be honest. I mean, you, you'd hope the players that we've got in, we can develop them in the right way. Um, and speaking about Latte Laugh, um, you know, hopefully Rogers can chip in with a few more, even though I think he's just behind McGree for top goal scorer at the moment. I was looking at our top goal scorers the other day, and I was like, it's mad that McGree's still top scorer at the moment, considering it feels like we've not seen him for ages. But um yeah, it, it would be great to have a 15-plus a goal striker, but we don't. And hopefully, like I said, those couple of players in particular, but hopefully some others can can chip in with goals as well, uh, would make a, a bit of a difference. If we can add to the squad in January, that would be even better. But we're not going to go out and buy a 15-plus goal striker in January because we can't afford to. It's It's going to be all about trying to develop players in the right way. Um, I had a, a bit of a prediction with um, my mates yesterday, I think it was, that I don't think we start to see the full potential of this team until about March or April, and that's when it will start clicking and people will start like scoring, because I think this this is a team that's built long-term, and I think some of, some of the players that, that we have at the moment, we are still waiting for them to to click and, and become more integral parts of the team. I think we are starting to see that a little bit with Morgan Rogers now. Um, to my memory, he came on earlier than he has done in a while as a, as a sub yesterday. Um, and see, like, like they laugh, we, we kind of know what he offers at the moment. We just need him to, to kind of learn some learn a little bit of composure and uh, ho- hopefully he can start chipping in as well but I, I don't think in in terms of the potential we start hitting our full potential until the the later part of the season can i just add a point to that when morgan rogers came on yesterday i realized just how young this borough team is you have vandenberg you've got engels what 24 25 jones is 24 but then you've got sam greenwood who's what 21 corburn's 20 Morgan Rogers himself is like 20 21 so there's and Hackney of course as well there's players in this team that are very young and I think we forget that and the fact that we can consider Isaiah Jones is probably one of the not seniors but one of the more experienced parts of this team despite only being 24 like I know he's no spring chicken anymore in terms of football he's not like an 18 year old but he's not like you know, on the the other side of his career either. He's still relatively young and this team is young. And I realised that when the subs were made, I was like, God, this Middlesbrough team is is really, really young. So, you know, you're going to have that. There may be a few teething issues, shall we say, and we're going to 
hopefully as fans allow them to grow and develop, make mistakes, learn from them. And I agree with Tom. I think it'll be probably towards the the, the latter stages of the season where we'll see this team performing at near maximum potential or uh, ability. Sorry. Yeah, we're on that on that journey, isn't it? I think the, the team's so young, and I'll be interested to see what we do. I think in the January window as well. I know Tommy was saying that everyone you're not going to sign a 15 goal season striker, but you can definitely sign someone who could potentially start to chip in, or if they just fit the system, you just never know, do you? I think sometimes I know January is a bit difficult to to get the right person in. Last year, so it was a bit of an anomaly bringing Archer and Ramsey in, and they were both amazing. Uh, but it's just uh, yeah, it's it's very difficult, right? I feel like it would be loan signings in in yeah. January. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier about McNair and his contract. If that's still not resolved by January and he hasn't signed an extension or anything like that, I can see him leaving. Uh, I think I said this on a previous pod as well because we'd have about we'd have four centre back uh, centre back options in Fry, Lenahan, Vandenberg, and Clark, who has obviously come back into the fold recently. I'd like to see him get a little bit more game time, but I can't see where that's going to come. Um, but then I could see us using that money from like any fee that we get from McNair. I can see us using it on a right back, uh, with the injury with Tommy Smith. Um, obviously, Vandenberg's been playing out of position there. We'd have Dyke still there, but we wouldn't have two players for that position. And I could see a right back coming in in a similar sort of mold to what we brought in with Engel and Bangura, where it'll be from a, a different league, cheaper signing that we can develop long term. And then I think anything else to kind of really supplement the squad that we have will be a loan sign. And, and I think it'd probably be like loan signings from the Premier League. Probably a similar sort of strategy to what we had last season. But obviously, it depends what quality is out there. I don't have any names to throw out at the moment who we could get. But I, I feel like that's the way we'd go. Cool. All right, then, well, let's move on. Let's go to Bora Church then and start to preach. It is the present place. Ah, yes, the praise and place. The only place where to give praise to a player, coach, staff member, the fans, Sam Greenwood's free kick, or anything other than that. And maybe Dana's purple hair. Um, Congratulations, Dana, um, on your purple I was waiting hair. for that. Yeah, well, there you go. I thought Thanks. I'd add to it. So, hey, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll come to you first, Dana. Who is first in your praise and place this week? I want to put Michael Carrick in there for being proactive in his substitutions. One of the criticisms I've levelled at him is that maybe he's a little bit passive and he leaves it late. He's probably a little bit too trusting of the players on the on the pitch to a fault. But to be fair to him, yesterday he made the substitutions at the right times. I want to credit Zai Jones for his defensive work. Like Going forward, he wasn't great, let's be honest. But defensively, he was absolutely brilliant. The tracking back... The tackling, last ditch, making sure that he's in the right positions to be able to help out Ralph Vandenberg. Really good from Jones. I do not think that that should go uncredited. He's very much uh, a fantastic defensive player now, and he, you know, he has his his moments going forward. But defensively, he's very, very good. And then I also want to praise Josh Goldburn actually because I thought he did really well in that first half. His hold up play was good. He caused them problems up against two fairly big centre-halves, especially Vestergaard and the David Luiz look-alike. So I think it was a very good performance from him in which he's he's obviously developed. And I, I, I thought that the Plymouth game was probably his best game this season. I think that that performance in the first half against Leicester was c- the continuation of that. So I just want to credit Corbin for that. Yeah, he's, he's, he's just improving. He's on call, and he? I think, as a kid, you know, and he's always going to mm. get the the... The divided attention of Borough fans of just how many goals he scores, but if he's contributing to that in different ways, then that's great. Um, but Tom, who's going to be in your place this week? Uh, yeah, so I've got three. Uh, I'll just go and, and back up what Dana said about Isaiah Jones for defensively yesterday. Outstanding. Uh, didn't think he was great going forwards um, as well, but yeah, he, he tracked back and made some vital tackles. And then I've already mentioned the other two, Senny Dieng and Rav Van Denberg. Um, Dieng showed some some good shot, shots up yesterday, kept us in it a couple of times with some good saves. And then Van Denberg, like we've said, it, it was just a very, very mature performance from him. Um, actually got a fourth. I'll keep Hayden Hackney in there um, just because, yeah, I, I said I would. So, <laughs> <laughs> Like every week to see some there. Doesn't matter what he does. Red every cards. Week, every week. Right, every... <laughs> Very good. Uh, I was going to say, 
for me, I'm going to go Rav Vandenberg from what we were saying earlier, fantastic yesterday. And I'm just going to say to the ref as well for his, his shittest and best decision of the day. <laughs> give him a break for us to win it. Um, so <laughs> it was an awful decision, but I'll give him it for a point mm-hmm. for that uh, alone. Um, but like, uh, let's move on. Uh, let's move on to Borough Trivia. Or I'm going to say a, a new segment called Owls Your Knowledge. Um, just try to borrow it and go Owls Your Knowledge, miss. Um, and I go with one question and then I'll ask you a second one in just afterwards as well um but the question i want to use to answer within the 30 seconds is there's four players with three goals each in the bristol city versus four fixture since uh or nine or ten to 2023 20, 24 can you name them can you name the four players with three goals each in the fixture um your time starts now <laughs> And time is up. Um, I've got your answers, guys. Uh, I'll let you work together on this one as, as well, since it is four names. Um, so if one of you doesn't get it, I'll let you have the assist on for the other one. Um, but who should I go first? Tom, I think I'll go with you first, actually, this week. Um, who who are you for? Right, well, I've got three because my mind went blank for a fourth. I did have a fourth. I just can't remember who it is. I've gone with Marvin Elliott, Britt Sunbelonger, and Aidan Flint. <sighs> I just feel like Marvin Elliott always used to score against us. So, yeah. It's not like, I, I can't, yeah. still can't remember who the fourth was. Uh, you've got the one. You've got one, and it's Britta Um mm. uh, And unfortunately, Elliott's not in there. You've got two, um, which is a bit odd, considering. Um, but, <laughs> Dana, how, what's yours? What are you, you going to go for? I've gone for Hunky Cruxy and Uncle, yes. Uncle Albert. I think Crooks always seems to score against Bristol City and Adorma probably contributed on both sides there. He did. So, he did. Yeah. So you've got three out of the four. So you've got Britt, Albert Adorma oh. and Matt Crooks. The fourth one is a Bristol City player and it's Naki Wells uh, of all players mm. who got... I know it's easy to say this after the fact, but that's the name I was forgetting. I had that at the start of writing it down and I was like, no, I need to get Marvin Elliott in there. I need to get Asante Lunger in there. Oh, for God's sake. Um, Kicking himself well, now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a tough <laughs> one, you know, tough questions, these, but there's one question I just wanted to answer, and it's probably for the people that are in maybe the car or on the way at work, or just listen, whether they walk a dog or whatever, however they listen to this podcast, who knows, but I, I found something up the other day, and I was like, this is a good one to, to put in, but true or false, Aidan Flint has scored more goals for Bristol City than he had appearances for Borough, um, true or false? Appearances. <laughs> Uh, Sorry. appearances <laughs> Sorry. Um are you gonna go who's an, who who's answering that? Sorry, I sorry I took that off you there. Sorry, Johnny. Uh no, no, you just can no what we can have a true or false each. So more scored more goals for Bristol City but... than made appearances for Borough. I think mm-hmm. that's false. Just I think it's true because I don't think you'd have put it in if it was false. Like it would just be a given for most players. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Well, it is very, very close. Very close. Oh, it's um, not true or false. So Dyke no. Steel. Dyke Steel. Um <laughs> it, no, it is it is false, but just just so he scored thirty eight goals for Bristol City and made 42 appearances for Borough. Um so it's yeah. very, very close. But I was just like, that's one of those things where you just go. Well, that's 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 off it. Um, so anyway, that's how I thought about that. But let's move on. Speaking of Bristol City, um, Borough obviously are playing them in, after the international break, and Liam Manning has just taken in charge of his first game as manager of them as well. Both teams uh, next week up at 10th and 11th, and Borough got Ashton Gate hoping for a win. Uh, but we spoke to Patch from Three Peeps in a pod to find out a little bit more about Bristol City start. <laughs> 
Hey, it's Patch Warner here from Three Peeps in a Podcast, Robin's Review, a Bristol City podcast. So far this season, we've won six, drawn four and lost six. We've got a goal difference of zero and find ourselves currently lying in the 11th place, one place below Borough. It's been a tumultuous few weeks with Nigel Pearson leaving and Liam Manning coming in to take over. It's early days, but yesterday we picked up a point on the road at a QPR team that have also experienced a manager coming in. It wasn't the QPR side that had been struggling at the bottom. Uh, and the game lacked excitement and a draw was a fair outcome for me. Liam's only had two and a half days to spend with the players and to start to understand the job at hand. And now we have the international break for him to get his messages across in and out of possession and also how he wants the team to play going forward. Uh, From what we've seen, he's a modern coach with a lot to offer on the training ground and needs to be given the chance to prove himself in the championship and instill his ways of working. And who knows what the future will bring. Uh, We've been playing predominantly in a 4-2-3-1 formation. However, for me, that does not get the best out of our strikers. And as a consequence, we found a lot of our goals recently coming from defence, in particular Rob Dickey, who we signed from QPR. It's our defenders also that we've been given um, our Man of the Match awards to in recent games. It's difficult to predict how we'll line up in two weeks' time. I'm hoping that we'll go for two up front to get the best out of the likes of Tommy Conway and Andy Vyman, but we still need that attacking flair from down the wings. It's going to be a really interesting game. Can't wait for Liam Manning to experience a game at Ashton Gate, and let's hope we get the three points. Key players to look out for. It's a difficult one to answer, as they're all capable of an 8 out of 10 performance. But just lately, we've seen more 5s and 6s and some 4s. I just hope that Tommy Conway, we get the best out of him, who's going to be some player in the future, and he's really coming into his own over the last couple of seasons. And Jason Knight, who's a tenacious midfielder that can drive forward and create opportunities as well as score goals. Really looking forward to seeing Middlesbrough in a couple of weeks' time at Ashton Gate. And uh, yeah, come on, you Red. Thank you very much uh, for that, Patch. Um, Guys, let's... uh get some predictions in and obviously a lot has happened um at bristol city over the last few weeks now just basically getting sacked probably the first time they've been fairly stable um in a while uh bristol city well, probably the best time he's, he's had a, a bristol city and he ended up getting sacked which is a bit odd but obviously it was all starting to to fall when he was uh mentioning the owners and not investing obviously with alex scott going to to, to bournemouth as well but what's your predictions guys could be a really tough one because given that we don't have much on on liam manning's uh, bristol city um tana what's your what are you thinking well whenever i think of bristol city i think of a defeat so unfortunately i am going to have to go for you know what actually no i'm gonna go for a draw but the one that will feel like a defeat uh i'll go to all mm, two all for dinner and tom what are you gonna go for I'm going to one borough. Um, Mac Crooks is going to score and continue on his uh, goal scoring record against them. And I also predict that it's going to be a very difficult game to watch uh, from the 2D football manager view that they clearly have as their, their camera <laughs> angle. <laughs> That's a very underrated comment. That <laughs> it's very underrated. <laughs> oh, it, it's the same every season, isn't it? Like you, you play Bristol away, and then you look at like where they're, they're recording from, and it's like the International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, it's, though. It's so true. This broadcast being brought to you by NASA. Um, <laughs> so, just <laughs> uh, I was going to say, I think. Uh, We'll win. I think we'll we'll just uh, nick one. I think it's it's very it's, it's interesting with new managers because sometimes you get the bounce, um, and obviously naturally you get a bounce because teams don't really know how to judge it. And there's other times where uh, you know it, it it doesn't really work out. Like a, like when Rooney, for example, he's trying to get his methods across and it's failing miserably. Um, so, but they've got a break now. They've got a couple of weeks before the play of Borough, but I think we'll just edge. I'm going to go with 2 1 Borough win. Um, I think Marvin Emnez and Marley Martin will score for, for Borough um, just to, to seal, the, seal the win. Um, but, guys, thank you very much uh, for joining me as always. And to listeners and the viewers, thank you very much for watching and listening to us. And also, thank you to the whole boy and Jake as well for letting us use uh, the clips on for, for Sandy D. Yang. But for right now, Bora out Fox the Foxes and are two points off the playoff places with plenty of games to play. This has been the Bora Breakdown podcast, and that was our Bora Master Chatter in a pod of the Bora Breakdown.